As you watch this, the geopolitics of Asia Pacific are undergoing a spectacular change, one that won't be felt properly for years, but which has the power to transform the entire region. No, we're not talking about China's increasing assertiveness, or are we talking about the fate of Taiwan, although that certainly factors into it. Instead, we're talking about Japan's momentous decision to rearm, to become the planet's third largest spender on defense, and so the government hopes, undertake the nation's biggest buildup of its armed forces since 1945. A plan, in short, to turn Tokyo into a great military power. Announced by Prime Minister Fumio Kishida at the end of 2022, the plans represent the biggest overall of Japan's defense posture in decades. From purely defensive weapons, the government now intends to procure missiles capable of striking mainland China. It plans to boost its maritime and air forces and reinforce its island territories against attack. So, what caused such a shift in this famously pacifist nation? And how might a heavily armed Japan affect the balance of power in Asia? Well, in today's episode, we're going to dive deep into Tokyo's plan to become a regional military power and ask what it means for Japan's allies and its enemies alike. For those uh, with even a passing interest in Asian defense news, it was one of the biggest stories of the last decade. On September the 16th, 2022, the government of Fumio Kishida released new versions of Japan's three key security documents, the National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy, and the Defense Program. The first key update since 2013, the documents were notable for the bluntness with which they described the situation facing Tokyo, calling it the most severe and complex security environment since the end of World War II and declaring a need for fundamentally reinforcing Japan's capabilities. But it wasn't just the unusual language that caught analysts' eyes, but the response the documents proposed. A defense spending spree unmatched in recent Japanese history. A sharp shift away from a security budget equivalent to 1% of GDP and towards something closer to the NATO 2% standard. In other words, a call for Japan to undergo its largest rearmament since the end of the Second World War. What was particularly surprising about this was the guy fronting the plan. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is known internationally for his commitment to nuclear disarmament and was assumed to come from his party's more dovish wing. Now here he was, overseeing a security strategy that would, if implemented, catapult Japan from ninth place in overall defense spending to third place, behind only the United States and China. That sort of shift is what we in the analysis business like to call a really big deal. The sort of thing that no one 12 months earlier would have had on their bingo card for the year. So, what changed? And see the answer. You need to only look at three of Japan's nearest neighbors. China. Russia, North Korea. Of these, China is the nation that spooks Tokyo the most. The national security strategy named Beijing the greatest strategic challenge ever to securing the peace and stability of Japan. Polls, meanwhile, show 90% of Japanese distrust China. Yet, while the rise of China and Beijing's increased aggressiveness are Tokyo's number one security concern, it was another nation that helped propel this dramatic shift. A nation currently waging a genocidal war in Europe. A nation known as the Russian Federation. The full-scale invasion of Ukraine wasn't just a wake-up call to Europeans. Over 8,000 kilometers away, the sight of Russian missiles crashing into Kiev sent shockwaves through Tokyo. This foreign policy wrote that a major power armed with nuclear weapons could invade a neighbor with impunity seeking to unilaterally change borders by force shook Japan to the core. Suddenly, all the old certainties about the world order melted away, reduced to insubstantial nothings by the fires burning in Ukraine's cities. Kushida even claims that, to quote, Ukraine is the future of Asia. By that, he didn't mean Putin would try to conquer Japan, although Tokyo and Moscow have an active dispute over islands seized at the end of World War II. I mean, no one really thinks that the Kremlin wants to hoist its flag over a bomb-shattered Japan. Rather, the PM seems to have realized that what could happen in Europe could also happen in Asia. That if one nuclear-armed state were willing to attack a non-nuclear neighbor, then others might do so too. Sadly for Japan, it has two nuclear-armed adversaries right on its doorstep. The biggest of these is also the one we already mentioned. China is suspected of wanting to retake Taiwan by force in the next few years, a conflict that would undoubtedly pull in Japan. According to the Japan Times, this is the major parallel Kushida keeps highlighting, a potential Asian version of the Ukraine crisis that would unfold right on Japan's doorstep, a doorstep that, unfortunately, just happened to comprise disputed islands that China claims as its own. 
Still, Beijing wasn't the only threat the new security documents highlighted. In recent years, North Korea's saber rattling has become an anxiety inducing fact of life in Japan. The Hermit Kingdom routinely tests missiles through Japanese airspace without warning, and Kim's rhetoric towards Tokyo has been pure bellicosity. These, then, are the challenges Japan faces, the reason why the government feels the need to urgently divert funds toward the military. In Fumio Kishida's words, Unfortunately, in the vicinity of our country, there are countries carrying out activities such as enhancement of nuclear capability, a rapid military build-up, and unilateral attempt to change the status quo by force. To challenge this, Tokyo has one ace up its sleeve. Piles and piles of money. The year that Kushida's government unveiled its new strategy, 2022, the Japanese defense budget was 5.4 trillion yen, or around $40 billion. Now, that's not nothing. As we mentioned a moment ago, it was enough to make Tokyo the ninth largest military spender in the world. But it's only because Japan's economy is so large that a spending cap of 1% of GDP still works out at a significant amount. Lift that cap, though, and Japan will become one of the biggest defense spenders on Earth. That's exactly what the current plan envisages. From 2023 to 2027 inclusive, the defense budget should be a combined 321 billion US dollars. That means Japan will end the period spending 8.9 trillion yen, or 66 billion dollars, in 2027 alone. The Brookings Institute notes that this is a 65% increase in spending. Nor is it only the defense budget proper that's getting a boost. Other security-related fields are getting their own increases, from the Coast Guard to science and technology sectors working with military technology. If you've heard it bandied around that Japan is increasing its defense budget to 2% of GDP, this is why. While the actual defense budget won't reach those heights, related and adjacent spending will bring the overall total up to NATO standard, despite Japan not being a part of the alliance. Already these increases are becoming visible. The 2023 budget is 26% higher than last year's, the biggest year-on-year -year defense budget increase in modern Japanese history. All this extra money will be used for everything, from developing counter-strike capabilities to building up stockpiles, all with the goal of deterring future aggression. As the National Defense Strategy document darkly noted, Ukraine's defense capability was insufficient to deter Russian attack. Japan doesn't want to find itself in the same position. Now, we'll get into exactly what all these purchases mean in the next chapter. For now, though, let's simply take a moment to absorb how massive a shift this is, how such an increase is destined to reshape Japanese society. So since World War II, the country has been constitutionally pacifist, and keeping defense spending low was seen as a way to ensure that Japan couldn't wage war. Key to this was the sword and shield policy and America's role in it. At its most basic, the policy saw the US as the sword, meaning American bases on islands like Okinawa would handle a return strike on any nation that attacked Japan. Tokyo itself, meanwhile, was the shield, the part charged with protection. To this end, the self-defense forces were founded in 1954 on the strict understanding that they would only be used to protect the homeland. Or, as the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute has put it, Japan has capped military spending at 1% of GDP and limited its military capabilities to what is needed to repel an armed attack on its territory. Now, that's not to say no Japanese leader has ever tried to bend these rules before. Under Shinzo Abe, Tokyo changed its rules to authorize troops deployed abroad on UN missions to use force. It was also Abe who, in 2017, announced that the 1% spending rule would no longer be followed. In 2020, the defense budget finally breached the ceiling for the first time since 1960. Admittedly, though, these were baby steps, hampered by a public firmly against increased military spending. In 2018, just 19% of Japanese wanted a larger defense budget, against 58% who wanted it to stay the same. What's happening now, though, is of a different order of magnitude. Not so much building on Abe's work as eclipsing it. In this, Kushida is being helped by a public that swung behind him. A poll conducted after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine showed 55% of Japanese wanting more defense spending. But he's also helped by a USA that's looking to shift the cost of its own defense burden. Feeling the strain of trying to contain nuclear rivals in both Europe and Asia-Pacific, Washington is more than happy to start sharing the sword role with Tokyo. Not that it's going to be easy. To grasp that blade, Tokyo will need to quickly acquire new capabilities far beyond anything it's wielded in the post-war era. Capabilities that will turn this land of cherry blossoms and mountains into a picturesque fortress. Of all the way Tokyo is looking to up its game, perhaps none is as important as the ability to conduct counter-strikes. If you're wondering what that means, counter-strike capabilities are exactly what they say on the tin, the ability to hit back at any enemy who hits you. 
To return the cruise missiles they've just fired and exact payback. While the most nations ever expect to use these capabilities, the main reason for having the ability to conduct counter-strikes is to ensure that your adversaries are aware of the potential pain and never attack you in the first place. Japan doesn't have this capability. For years, the country instead relied on layered air and missile defense systems, which ensured that no potential attack would be able to reach its target. Today, though, China and North Korea simply have too many ballistic and cruise missiles, enough to overwhelm Japan's defense systems and leave vital targets vulnerable. If that happened tomorrow, Japan would have no ability to punch back. Its coastal defense missiles are limited to a range of just 200 kilometers. Even the air-to-air -air missiles it recently purchased from Norway can only travel 480 kilometers. This won't be the case for much longer, though. A key part of the new defense strategy is to procure missiles with a range of over 1,600 kilometers, far enough to strike Beijing or Pyongyang. The opening phase of this is an agreed purchase of 500 Tomahawk cruise missiles from the USA. But there will be a focus on domestic production too. The Japanese MOD recently signed a contract with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries for an upgraded version of their Type 12 anti-ship missile. In this case, in variants that can be launched from the ground, from the air, or from other ships. Although the Type 12 is already in use, the new upgrades will both wildly increase its range and also make it more stealthy. Not that it's the only anti-ship missile contracted for production. A separate contract will design and build a new generation of long-range anti-ship missiles that can be launched from submarines. Add to this, uh, recent orders for F-35A carried joint strike missiles as well as joint air-to-surface standoff missiles for F-15s, and it's fair to say that Tokyo is on a missile-buying bonanza. Or rather, a joint bonanza of both buying and development. In that second category comes the proposed new hypersonic glide missile intended for delivery in 2026. Envisioned as a weapon that can be ground-launched by units stationed on Japan's remote islands, they will be designed and produced domestically to help break Tokyo's reliance on outside suppliers. This concept of building local production capacity goes right to one of the core goals of the new defense strategy. At the moment, Japan boasts a world-class shipbuilding industry and a decent set of companies capable of turning out land-based defense systems. Where it falls down, though, is on air power and counter-strike. When Tokyo needs jets or missiles, it almost always has to look to America. SIPRI estimates the US provides 80% of Japan's needs in these areas. And that won't change overnight. Setting up a new industrial base for making this stuff is a difficult, lengthy process. But the government wants to spend the money to try and make it happen. At the same time, new contracts should boost pre-existing industries. Of the 37 major new ships called for, all will be built domestically in Japan. This includes two new Aegis system-equipped vessels, ASEV, designed for ballistic missile defense, a pair of multi-billion dollar destroyers that will be able to take out even hypersonic glide weapons. Perhaps more impressively, Japan will team up with the UK and Italy to develop a sixth-generation fighter jet. And while Tokyo waits for that to be ready, it's happy to spend on foreign kit in order to plug the gaps. Back in 2020, the US gave the green light to Japan, purchasing 105 F-35s for $22 billion. It's this package the bulk of the new aircraft come from, including eight F-35A Lightning II Joint Strike Fighters and eight F-35B Lightning Multi-Role Fighter aircraft that were bought this year. Of course, though, all that money isn't just going on fun new gadgets and impressive weapons platforms. The Council on Foreign Relations lists other priorities, including developing integrated operational planning, including a new joint command and investing in the force's resilience and making civilian airfields and ports accessible to the SDF. Some of that stuff is as basic as new infrastructure, and at the other end it includes turning the southwestern islands into micro-fortresses, beefing them up with so many anti-ship and air defenses that Chinese navy vessels won't be able to come near them. Alright, so that's a quick overview of some of the kit Japan is buying, a brief vision, if you will, of the shiny new military power that Tokyo could become. And the key word in that sentence is could, because some experts fear that none of this is as simple as the three security documents make out. That Japan faces more problems than anyone is acknowledging. Problems that could end Tokyo's race for rearmament before it's even truly begun. When assessing Japan's prospects for rearmament, plenty of experts have sounded warnings about plenty of issues. There's Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, for example, which commits the nation to only ever utilize its forces in self-defense. And while Kishida's government has a nice line about only ever striking first if an attack was imminent and unavoidable, there's a whole section of Japanese society that instinctively recoils at any hint of militarization. But such PR stuff could be the least of Tokyo's worries. The Diplomat magazine recently ran an article that dug deep into the current obstacles facing Kushida. Their conclusion? The manpower problems already suffered by the self-defense forces make rearming Japan a near impossibility. 
The core issue is that the SDF is desperately lacking professional soldiers and sailors. Of the 247,000 service members, the force should have a full 16,000 positions currently unfilled. That means there are signs of strain wherever you look. The magazine highlighted the specific impact on the maritime self-defense forces, where a lack of capable sailors means those present are forced to take on extra duties to the point of exhaustion. To be fair, the MSDF is still capable of doing its duties. Even with the manpower problems, it's not like working ships are being left in dock for lack of crew. The diplomat's point, though, is that barely being able to keep Japan's current forces functioning does not bode well for the massive scaling up in all domains that Kushida envisages. Especially not when you take into account Japan's well-documented population crisis. Japan's fertility rate hasn't reached the replacement threshold for population since the 1970s. Over the last few years, the overall population has begun to decline. From a high of 128 million in 2017, Japan's population is projected to slump to 53 million by 2100. Now, if that sounds a long way off, the key point to remember, the current effects are less visible as a full-on population collapse and more as a rapidly aging society. According to the BBC, 28% of Japan's population are over 65, the second highest rate in the world only after Monaco. Meanwhile, the proportion of young people is shrinking. In 1994, there were nearly 17.5 million young adults aged 18 to 26 in Japan. By 2020, that had fallen to 9 million. This is a huge problem for any country wanting to boost its military capabilities. Armies require a lot of young, able-bodied people to do the physical stuff that older people can't. They also want to bring career soldiers in young and train them for a lifetime of service. For a nation with a shortage of young people, that's a huge task, one made even harder by the private sector offering perks and salaries that the self-defense forces just can't compete with. And then there's the cultural aversion to anything that smacks of war. As the diplomat writes, while Japanese politicians are more willing than ever to contemplate an assertive defense policy, pacifism and an aversion to military service remain deeply entrenched in post-war Japanese society. In the last few months, the JSDF has tried to come up with creative workarounds to these problems to try and make the potential candidate pool as wide as possible. One such method has been a proposal to end the ban on people with tattoos serving. Originally put in place due to an association with the Yakuza, the ban has stopped many ordinary young people from considering the JSDF as a career choice. Really though, there are probably no quick fixes here. Making the military an attractive career in any country requires investment, good pay, good working conditions, and a culture that encourages people from a wide range of backgrounds to join. Things, in short, that require time and money. And it's here that we get to the second major problem. Because money may be something that Japan simply doesn't have enough of. As the world's third largest economy, the idea that Japan can't finance whatever the hell it feels like might sound pretty ridiculous. After all, far smaller economies like Israel spend way more than 2% of their GDP on defense without suffering financial collapse. The issue is that these smaller economies usually have a society that accepts the need for some pain in return to defense gains. In Japan, that's simply not the case. Especially when it comes to one of the main ways governments can raise money. Taxes. Tax hikes in Japan have a history of being political cyanide, the draft of death for whoever is trying to implement them. Public polling shows consistent, large majorities being against any tax increases to fund defense spending. While Kushida recently got his defense spending bill through the Japanese Dart, it notably delayed any tax increases until 2027. Instead, the government is desperately trying to find sources of non-tax revenue to spend on the JSDF. In the final bill, this partly came in the form of reallocating surplus funds from the foreign exchange special account. But it's worth pointing out, this money doesn't just appear from nowhere. By moving money from other budgets, Japan is having to refocus its priorities just at a moment when social spending to care for the elderly population is skyrocketing, when public debt is running at 250% of GDP. It's not for nothing that the Brookings Institute wrote of the defense spending plans, generating and sustaining this massive amount of new funding over the next several years and beyond may not be easy. But let's just put all of that aside for a moment. After all, Kushida's spending bill cleared the dart. Let's assume that all this turns out to be less an obstacle and more a minor speed bump. Even given all that, the JSDF still needs to worry about the investment gap. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace think tank published a fascinating piece back in February, arguing that decades of underinvestment meant the road to great military power status will be far longer than Kishida and his government realize. The basic premise is due to the 1% spending cap, Japan's existing military capabilities are a lot ropier than they first appear. To quote, 
Decades of low spending have left Japan's defense force with aging physical infrastructure, low munition stockpiles, old and insufficient air and sea lift, and refueling capabilities. To even think of turning the JSDF into a world-class fighting force, the government will need to heavily invest to upgrade all of these neglected areas. Current plans haven't put aside enough money for that. According to the article, and we'll just quote them again here, to fill this gap in the next five years, Japan would need to invest an additional 2% of GDP on top of planned increases just to offset one decade of underspending. That means Kushida would have to aim to spend a whopping 4% of GDP on defense. Now that's not unheard of. Israel, Kuwait, Algeria, Amman, and Qatar all spend more of their budgets this way. But to do that in Japan would mean implementing some steep tax rises or painful spending cuts, two things that are just politically impossible. As a result, the journey to military superpower status is likely going to be a long slog. The Carnegie Endowment piece estimates that the JSDF will likely, quote, still be dependent on the United States in many ways and limited in their ability to contribute to any regional crisis well into the 2030s. And with the clock ticking on a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan, the 2030s may be too late. Still, we don't want to end this video on a down note, nor do we want to give the false idea that pessimism is the correct reaction to Japan's ambitious plans. Whatever problems may lie ahead for Tokyo, there's no doubt that the new focus on defense represents one of Japan's biggest shifts in decades. If all goes to plan, it's a shift that will have profound implications, not just for the Japanese, but for the whole of East Asia and maybe for the whole world. For the first time in nearly eight decades, Japan will once again stand near the pinnacle of global military powers, a huge regional counterweight to China and a major force in its own right. Obviously, the circumstances that have led to this change are not ideal. The return of geopolitics to an era red in tooth and claw. The rise on Tokyo's doorstep of an assertive nuclear superpower as well as the ever more erratic behavior of rogue states like North Korea and Russia. But sadly, that's the era we now live in, and countries can either bury their heads in the sand or they can try to keep up with these rapidly changing times. With their defense spending plans, Fumio Kishida and his government have made their choice. Only the future will tell if it was indeed the right one for Japan's citizens.